My name is John LaBelle. I'm a professor of architecture at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, New York. This is a lecture on Frank Lloyd Wright's early houses for my class on Frank Lloyd Wright at Pratt, given in the fall of 2017. So, uh, some historians like to say that it, now Frank Lloyd Wright died in 1959. If he had died in 1910, he would have almost 50 years earlier, he still would have been a ma an architect of major importance. So we're going to look today at the, uh, the initial ideas that Wright lays down that <coughs> stay fundamental to his uh, work. Now, I like to use the phrase uh, Frank Lloyd Wright before Frank Lloyd Wright. So, often uh, an architect will be fooling around with their ideas and then it comes into focus. And uh, anybody ever seen Le Corbusier's early work? This is Corbu. This is Corbu. So we don't think of that as Corbu. So, um, in some cases, Richard Meyer's first building is totally Richard Meyer. He made sure that um, he'd get it, get it down the first time. Anyway, there are a couple of houses by right here. <coughs> is one that's kind of neoclassical, quite handsome. He could have probably been a quite capable neoclassical architect. Here is uh, Tudor style. So here's a Tudor house, the uh, Nathan G. Moore house. And Wright, I don't know how many at this point, but eventually had six kids and expensive tastes. So the client wants a Tudor house, the client gets a Tudor house. So here we start seeing some initial inklings of Wright's idea. This is Wright's house for himself, 1889, although it keeps expanding. So I showed you this last week. This is Bruce Price, a New York architect. This is upstate, the Chandler house. And we see a slope roof. This is right, the slope roof, Palladium window, Palladium window, two bays, two bays. So right starting off in um, in this uh, shingle style. But we also notice of architects, they often like to claim total originality. So um, when Wright visited Yale to lecture, the historian Vincent Scully says, what about the influence of the shingle style on your early houses? And Wright said, son, Architecture began when I started putting those houses out on the prairie. So we can't really rely on an architect for historical facts. Um, they're sort of protecting an image. It's called shingle style because the shingles are on the sides as well as the roof. You're using one of the bays for the entrance. And we were just looking at here. We come around and we get this view. And even though there's a lot of brown brick here, this is much more geometric. This is his office that he adds on later. So we can see he keeps adding on to this house as his office grows and his family grows. And he uh, buys the house next door to install his mother <laughs> to help take care of the kids. Inside we have an ingle nook, a favorite device of early right, which is seating on either side of a fireplace. And this is a time before TV or even phonograph records. And so you sit here after dinner and maybe look at picture books. Right over here is the piano. 
which you would have to play since there's no recorded music. And up here is the family motto. There's several versions of it, but it basically says truth against the world. <laughs> Here is the dining room, and these high back chairs make a room within the room. So everybody sitting here are like in an enclosed space. And it's, so it's very, um, it's very into the family, very into making a place for the family. This is uh, Wright's and his wife's bedroom. A friend of his did this mural. And he's got a very, like, contained space effect from this ceiling. This is the children's playroom. Here is uh, a friend of his did this mural. Here's Aladdin. Here's the lamp. Here's the genie. So it's a very magical room for the kids. Here's a piano. Here's the balcony, they can put on plays, uh, do Romeo and Juliet from the balcony, and their children's toys scattered all over the floor here. Here's inside the office, and this is looking in kind of old fashioned, but it's quite geometric. We have these rectilinear forms, a uh, flat roof, uh, this octagonal form. Now, this is Wright's first house on his own, Winslow House, and <coughs> Wright worked for Louis Sullivan, and to make extra money, he was doing houses off his kitchen table on his own, and you're not supposed to do that. Uh, if you get work, you're supposed to bring it into the office, and when Sullivan found out about it, he got very upset and fired Wright. He didn't speak for many years, and later sort of reconciled. Now this looks kind of neoclassical, somewhat symmetrical, but we start seeing hints of Wright's approach. One of them is horizontality. It's a two-story house, but the second story has this dark band and is in shadow from the overhanging roof. So it sort of looks like a one-story house, emphasizing the horizontality. If we come in through here, go through this arch, in the back we see it's more asymmetrical. This is starting to hint at what Wright's later work is going to look like. And this, ace, this symmetry uh, only partially carries into the inside. This is a very handsome dining area with glass all around. Here's the angle look again, fireplace in the center. This is a bit later, Wright's renderings of the house. Around 1910, he goes to Europe to work on a publication of his work. And this is one of the drawings for the publication. So we come in through here, and we hit the stables. So this is, um, these people have horses. Now, the key to Wright's early work is the prairie style. And we're going to go over that quite a bit today. And we start with 
Palladio's Villa Rotunda, putting the human being in the center. So the stone space makes a place for the human being. Here we have the Charles Ross House, early house by Wright, 1902. And we see it picks up the cruciform of Palladio, but he puts a chimney core, stair and chimneys, in the center so that we can't be in the center. Now, we, in a simplification, we might say there are three things, man, God, and nature. And in Middle Ages, God is central, most important thing, metaphysically the most important. In the Renaissance, we have humanism, which makes the human being the central and most important thing. Wright is not a humanist. He sees the human being as not separate and elevated, but as integral with nature. So he displaces the human being from the center and the human being meanders around the center, flowing from space to space in the open plan and from inside to outside as though a part of nature. So rather than the human being being central, most important human being is part of nature. And we might say there are two great humanist cultures and humanist architectural traditions. Anybody have a thought? What's the first great humanist culture? Ancient Greece. And with the Greeks we get the uh, emergence of the individual human being. Wright did not like Greek architecture. What's the other great humanist culture? The Renaissance. Wright did not like Renaissance architecture. Those were his two least favorite architectures. He liked Gothic and he liked uh, Byzantine, which are not humanist architectures. So it's not just the style, but the underlying cultural principles that are determining Wright's tastes. Now, Let's see the evolution of this cruciform open plan by Wright. Here we are back um, at the William Kent House. It's another house, it's a neighbor of the Chandler House we saw earlier by Bruce Price. Here's Price's plan. Look at how similar these are. Both cruciform, both stair and chimney in the center. Anybody spot a major difference in the plans? Yeah. You know, so the, uh, the Bruce Price one, the staircase is located directly in the center of the property, not along by the sidewalk or anything. Yeah. Um, I also noticed that there could be more, there could be more thresholds in Franklin Wright's house compared to Bruce Price's so home. More, more openings, more doorways. Right. It's a little more transparent. So there's two key differences. Uh, Wright has a term he likes to use, uh, destroy the box. He wants to do away with the boxy room. So I'm going to repeat that a few times. But here's a box. And if you want to play around with optical illusions, This does not give us a feeling of a box. This does. It's the corner that makes the box. No corner that you just to leave out. With a corner, you're boxed in. Can't get out. And so, The 
is a part. to make a point of not breathing on this wire. The, um, this room has corners. And there's a little return in the wall here so that we get this box effect. The return is gone here, so this room leaks into or flows into the next room. That's the open plan. In addition, this corner is gone, and we leak right out. We move along this wall, and boom, we turn at the corner. We move along this wall, we keep going. We leak right out. And then, as you pointed out, we have these walls of windows opening the rooms up. So, Wright starts not only in the appearance of his own house, but in his plans, starts with these Bruce Price shingle style houses, but then evolves them. So, the open plan. Wright is projecting that each room has a function that is, and a space that's defined as a box but rather one space flows into the other. In addition, if you, in this arrangement, if you stand here, you can see the adjoining room and it is defined for you. If you are here, this is all you can see. You don't know what's going on up here. Similarly, if you stand here, you can see here, but you have no idea what's going on here. So the house unfolds for you as you move through it. It's not there until you get there. Your motion through the house creates it, and the way you move through it causes it to unfold depending upon the path you're taking that time. Now here's another source of this open plan. We don't know that Wright was aware of it, but it's going on. Um, a key social reformer and feminist is Catherine Beecher, Harriet Beecher Stowe's sister. 1869, she publishes The American Woman's Home. And she envisions a, an open plan with a core. In the core is chimney, stairs, first floor, part of the kitchen, in the basement you've got the furnace, um, upstairs you have bedrooms, but in each case we have open flexible plans surrounding a core. Now, this is part of a um, digression here. This is part of the home economics movement. And with, in the early 20th, late 18th, late 19th, early 20th century, men are going to work in the factory. It's a long story. Women initially were the factory workers, but men are going to work in the factory. What's the role of the woman? Well, women were in trouble. Uh, if there's a feminist description of what is money. Money is green pieces of paper that men give each other for what they do. Women didn't figure that out. So women work as hard as men doing home work, at, you know, homework, but they don't get money for it. And uh, 
So today, due to labor-saving devices, you don't need that homework. How many people have a, are wearing any, an item of clothing right now that's been ironed? Well, when I was a kid, I was in school, my mother ironed my clothes. They didn't, it was, it was like crumpled cardboard. This has permanent press chemicals in it so that it doesn't look like this. You know, you just give it a good, and it looks fine. There's a lot of chemistry went into that. Uh, so women aren't ironing all day. I came home from school, my mother's watching soap operas and ironing. And she's a person who did high school in three years, Barnard in three years, and the first woman to go to Columbia Law School. But I got home, she's ironing. Uh, you know, until I learned how to do it, she made breakfast. There were no Pop-Tarts <laughs> that you could put in a toaster. Uh, and my grandmother, I mean, it took an hour to get the, the coal hot enough in the stove to cook breakfast. You just turn the switch and gas pops on or the electricity pops on. So women can now be part of the professions, but that wasn't the case at this time. So what are women going to do? And there are three, there are several different arguments. One was we should have communal living with hired people doing the cooking and the homework so women can work the same as men. Another argument was Women should harness industrial efficiency so that they can apply that industrial efficiency to their work in the home the way the men do in the factory. And we have the birth of home economics. That's Catherine Beecher's position here. So you might observe that in a fireplace, the fireplace sucks in cold air from under the door and sends all the warm air up the chimney. What was the solution for that? By one of our great inventors, also founder of our country. Anybody? The Franklin stove by Benjamin Franklin. You make an iron stove and the fire is contained in the stove, which then heats up the iron and warms the room. You know, a uh, fireplace sucks cold air in and sends it all up the chimney. So here are the Franklin stoves, and here are over the door vents to bring in the fresh air over the door so you don't have a draft on the floor. So there's a whole lot of mechanical engineering thought going into this arrangement. So here are these vents. Here's our contained stove, or the main furnace. Here's a Franklin stove, etc. Okay, so that's some of the sources of the open plan. Hints of it beginning with the shingle style and then Catherine Beecher's observing how we're going to culturally respond to changing economic conditions. Nineteen hundred, nineteen oh two, Frank Lloyd Wright does the Ward Willett House, and this is considered the first fully realized manifestation of his prairie style. So we're going to uh, eventually list all the elements of the prairie style. But we see here a symmetry, horizontality, two-story house, but notice the second story kind of disappears under the shadow here. Low sloped overhanging roof. So, asymmetrical, prairie style, asymmetrical, open plan. Destroy the box. It's part of the open plan. We were flowing from one room to another. Interpenetration of inside and outside. Whole walls opening up with glass. Massive chimney core pinning it down. You don't see the chimney here, we will in a moment. 
low sloped overhanging roof, rectilinear interpenetrating planes. So we have this plane, this plane. We have a, look at my hands. We, we, we kind of have this kind of effect of these interpenetrating planes. Horizontality. This is like the prow of a ship. It's though we're moving across the prairie. American openness, movement westward, change. Now, all these slides are uh, on the LMS. If you, if you, they're in PowerPoint, so you can open a PowerPoint and grab this text if you want to paste it into a Word document, and also this recording will be online. I'll email you when it's up. Now, we get up to the bedrooms upstairs. We have these boxy individual rooms, but these flowing open spaces uh, we have downstairs. And then we get more functional when we get to the back. We had servants in those days. This is a big home for rich people. And so the kitchen is a big operation. We have pantries, we have an ice box rather than a refrigerator. You need ice delivered. So running a kitchen, producing the food was a, uh, a big operation. Here's a beautiful photograph. And, and now, this is Katsura in Japan. And Wright has not seen Katsura yet. He gets to Japan in 1905. But there was a Japanese temple in the 1893 World's Fair that, in Chicago that Wright saw. And so rectilinear frame that's structural with infill panels of non-structural wall. We start to see kind of Japanese elements showing up into Wright's work. Here is Katsura Imperial Villa. Uh, I hope everybody remembers that from survey. Integrated into its landscape, asymmetrical, interpenetration of inside and outside, functional layout. And here we are, Ward Willett, integrated into its landscape, asymmetrical, functional layout. We'll see this getting even closer to Katsura and Mike's work later. In addition, this house becomes a major source of a modernist aesthetic. So look at this kind of abstract geometric interpenetration of rectilinear planes. That's a mouthful. <laughs> uh, so Wright's work is published initially in Holland in the Wasmuth Folio and it becomes influential on a group of Dutch artists and architects who call themselves the Stiel, the style. And here we have a De Stiel painting and a De Stiel sculpture. We can see it coming directly from Frank Lloyd Wright. Here's Ritfeld's Schroeder House, um, again coming from Wright. And um, JJP Oud's Cafe, Again, these geometric interpenetrant uh, play of shapes. And so the whole European modernist aesthetic comes from this work by Wright. Here we see Van Doesburg. Uh, again, this play of rectilinear planes coming from Wright. And here, 30 years later, Mondrian. Again, coming directly from right. Schroeder House, much more modern and abstract, but the idea of these play of planes comes directly from right. Mies van der Rohe's project for a brick country house, 
open plan, interpenetration of inside and outside, asymmetry, uh, reaching out into nature, coming directly from right. Okay, so the most important Curry style house is the Roby House, 1909. And right away we see all these elements, uh, low sloped overhanging roof. This roof is not flat, but due to our angle, we don't see the low slope. Uh, interpenetrating planes. And now we see the massive chimney core pinning it down. Open plan flowing from one space to another. So, one of the things that happens with Wright's houses is we don't notice the entrance. So here we are, this would seem to be the main facade, we're coming along the street, no entrance. So we come along here, over down here, we have to come around, all the way around, and the entrance is here. It's looking very much like a garage. Actually, the garage is over here. So that's something to think about, why Wright treats the entrance that way. Now, emphasis on horizontality. Look at what it does to the brick. <laughs> he uses, first of all, he uses Roman brick. Can anybody tell me what Roman brick is? Okay, the material is the same as any other brick. It's, a, it's the proportion. A Roman brick is thinner and longer. Notice that he has wide mortar joints horizontally that are white and scooped out. The vertical joints are narrow, flush, and dyed red. Boy, Louis Kahn would never do that. And why, would, why does he do this? To emphasize the bones on the top. Correct. It makes it look more like horizontal stripes than blocky objects. Here's the living room. This is contemporary furniture, so disregard that. And the living room flows around and even through the chimney core to the dining area. So if you've been in a suburban house that there's a big fireplace in the center and the living room flows around to the dining area, and then there's a bar between the dining area and the kitchen, as opposed to a separate room. That all comes from Frank Lloyd Wright. So that's influenced by Wright's open plan. Here's the whole wall, uh, a little bit ornamented by our taste, but opening up to the outside with this. Now we use the term art glass, uh, which is a form of stained glass. And we'll talk a minute about these lights. So here we are flowing around and through the chimney core. He integrates a mechanical into his architecture. So with these windows, we're going to have all this glass, we're in Chicago, we're going to have a cold downdraft in the winter. And that is, uh, for the windows over here, uh, that downdraft is met by the radiators right under the window. And here, he's got a floor vent, which we can't really see right here, of uh, vents in the floor, and a heating pipe down here. So we have an upward draft of warm air countering this downdraft of cold air. We have uh, vents here allowing air to come up, to here and then vent out. So air circulates through here, and then we've got 
spots of light with these globes, and we have hidden light bulbs up here, giving indirect light through these vents. So here are our floor vents, and here we are looking up at these vents with light bulbs above them. And this will carry up air, venting it out of the room as well. Here's the windows with the radiator under each one, and here's the floor vent with the heat going up, countering the windows. Any questions about the Roby House? Okay, the Coombley House is a huge, magnificent house. Right, was getting some uh, major commissions. We'll talk more about when we get to the 1920s and the concrete tile houses, but in general, very rich people own these houses because it costs a fortune to, to uh, restore them, sometimes tens of millions in some cases. Uh, when you get one in bad shape and you've got to lift the whole thing up and redo the footings and put it back down. Uh, it's, but people are very serious about these houses. There's a beautiful, like, cupped hands quality to the Coonley living room containing the family. It's quite, now this is a blow up of this. So this is, imagine this over this. But it extends out into the landscape. It has a separate play room, little playhouse for the kids. <clears throat> and these are colorful stained glass windows in the kids' playhouse. These are in the Metropolitan Museum. Get a little American flag in there. This is the Susan Lawrence Dana house. Now, uh, Susan Lawrence Danis was a widow heiress to a silver mine fortune, and she wanted to become the leading hostess in Springfield. So she got a big, magnificent Frank Lloyd Wright house that she could throw her parties in. And it's, Wright didn't start from scratch, it's renovations to an existing house. So the ornament is all Frank Lloyd Wright, but some of the layout is influenced by what was there before. It's huge and sprawling. And one of the interesting things we see about the plan is there's a whole series of axes. We have these symmetrical axes, but there's numerous of them. No one controlling symmetrical axes. Very three-dimensional space. One of the wonderful things about this house is that when Susan Lawrence Dana was through with the house, she just gave it to a conservancy as a museum and walked away. Every piece of silverware, every piece of linen is all intact in there. So it's a perfect uh, museum of what the house originally was. Wright did all these stained glass. Well, here's our entrance, and above it is this stained glass motif. He uses a moth, a butterfly motif. We see that also in the windows and the light fixtures. It's filled with stained glass cabinets, interior doors, etc. The windows, uh, some of them have these sheaths of wheat. The color picks up the uh, brown grass of the Midwestern prairie. 
We have to mention the little house. Anybody know why we have to mention the little house? The living room's at the Metropolitan Museum. So the little house is being torn down. Uh, the Metropolitan Museum bought it, put it all, took it apart, put it in a warehouse, and installed the living room in the Metropolitan Museum. The American one. I wouldn't I wouldn't be showing it otherwise. It's I don't think it's that interesting. It's kind of boxy. The Yahara Boathouse, 1905, was not built. But what's interesting about this? This is like um, where lockers and stuff for where you launch your boats from. What's interesting about this? Totally flat roof. And they built it. <laughs> uh, just recently. Now here's another one, the Gale House. Anybody notice anything about this? This look familiar? It's falling water. Lower balcony, middle balcony, roof, lower balcony, middle balcony, roof. Uh, uh, Vertical core, vertical core, elements extending this way, elements extending this way. Um, so we'll talk about this more when we get to falling water. It's really uh, a hoot. Okay, so to review, prairie style, open plan, interpenetration of inside and outside, Massive chimney core, bands of windows. So we don't punch a hole in masonry, but rather we, the whole wall is uh, glass. Low sloped overhanging roof. Flat roofs uh, come later. So this looks flat, but it, it is low sloped. Uh, this is a three story house. But it looks like a one, you know, it looks much more horizontal as he puts these upper floors in shade. Rectilinear interpenetrating inter planes, so these planes were penetrating into each other. Horizontality, a sense of motion moving across the prairie and asymmetry. Otherwise known as modern architecture. Whether it's Mies, Corbeau, uh, the whole 1920s and 30s, that all comes from here. So, open plan, flowing from one side to another. Massive chimney core, interpenetration of inside and outside, whole wall opening up. Bands of windows, low sloped overhanging roof, cantilever. Rectilinear interpenetrating planes we've seen in these walls. Horizontality, sense of motion. Okay, we've got these, the prairie style. Open plan, interpenetrating places, chimney core. Why is that important? What's that about? Why do you do that? Uh, someone else could make round purple buildings. Uh, would that be important? Uh, and the reason why I write is important is because, let's say, architecture is a manifestation in form of the worldview of its culture. In other words, what was the early 20th century all about? And Wright, Wright manifests that in his architecture and indeed help bring it about. So, what do we mean by that? Here we are back at the Villa Rotunda, 
a humanist architecture that sees the human being as central and differentiated out from nature, giving it a central location from which to serve it. Here we are, 1941, uh, and still building that kind of architecture. Right isn't, but some are. So let's look at the change that Wright um, saw and why he saw that humanist architecture is no longer um, pertinent. So what goes on in the early 20th century? late 19th, early 20th. The decentering of the family. When Wright was growing up, the small farm was a place of production and consumption. They were self-sufficient. You grew your food, you canned your food, you cooked your food, you ate your food. In the early 20th century, production takes place in the factory or office and consumption in the home. So this becomes specialized as a place purely for consumption, no production. Uh, back in the 1950s, and even somewhat today, uh, if you lived in a suburban neighborhood and somebody down the street had chickens, you'd be really embarrassed when friends came over to visit. What are you, hillbillies here? Uh, what is this? Uh, you know, make the, how about, you know, you feed them to kitchen scraps and you get fresh eggs, makes sense. But, oh no, we buy our eggs in the grocery store. We work in an office, um, you know. And the sedan automobile is symbolic of this consumption. It means a sedan, the, the general vehicle is the pickup truck. The sedan says, oh, we, we can't haul hay, we don't haul hay in this vehicle. What's the number one selling car in the United States, vehicle in the United States today? The Ford F-150 pickup truck. What's the number two selling vehicle in the United States today? The, the Chevy Silverado pickup truck. And if you walk down the street and just eyeball the vehicles, it's about 50-50 SUVs and sedans. Um, in the city, you don't see that many pickup trucks, but you get out of the city, that's, that's, you know, the idea that you might throw stuff to pick up at Home Depot in the back of your pickup truck is the cool thing to do, but not in 50 suburbia, which is what's being created here. In the Victorian family, after dinner, the father goes to the smoking room, the mother goes to the sewing room, the children go to the nurseries, each with their own box. Now everybody just hangs out together. You don't have these defined roles anymore. Who's a, who, who here is a father? Who's, a, who's whose son or daughter or what? I mean, it's just a zoo. Uh, so, this is the place where that zoo can happen, where it's just all open and everybody's all over the place. When Wright was growing up, this was the universe. The Milky Way was the universe. In the 1920s, Edwin Hubble discovers that little fuzzy things that we thought were, we called them nebula, and they were maybe dust clouds, there were stars in formation, and then we got the world's Mount Wilson 100-inch telescope and the Mount Palomar 200-inch telescope, and we discovered that those fuzzy things were other galaxies, billions and billions of them. And now with Hubble, we can see them in super high resolution. When Wright was growing up, Newton's laws of physics held in space and time were absolute. In 1905 and 1950, Einstein published his special in general relativity, and space and time were in flux. We'll talk more later about what that means. But there's no fixed 
to say this is the center based on what? Relative to what? And in Newtonian physics, you could do that. You can't in special relativity. When Wright was growing up, painting was organized by perspective. So here is a Degas, does these ballet dangers. Degas is an impressionist. But even though this is an impressionist painting, look at how clear the perspective is. But then, in the early 1900s, we get cubism. And we don't have a fixed point of view. We're seeing this figure from multiple points of view. When Wright was growing up, novels were chronological. We then got, in the early 20th century, stream of consciousness novels. Marcel Proust, In Search of Lost Time, James Joyce, Ulysses, Virginia Woolf, To the Lighthouse, in which rather than there being a fixed chronological clock that measured when things took place, there's only the subjective experience of a character. When Wright was growing up, humans were the favored children, favored children of the creator. Now, uh, Darwin is, Darwin's book is before Wright was born, but it sort of takes a while to come into general consciousness. So with Darwin, human beings are on their own, just one more animal. Just humans are along here somewhere, but they're not special. Uh, here we go. Right. Uh, they're just, uh, you know, random accidents. When Wright was growing up, there were European empires. The Holy Roman Empire, the Habsburg Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Russian Empire, the British Empire, some of which saw themselves as descendants of Rome. After World War I, these empires are gone. And Wright helped end their architecture. So this is in the United States, but I should change that slide. But this is the kind of architecture these empires was building, rooted in Rome. Wright helps end that. I did a lot of research on this, and uh, so I'll put these slides in occasion. It's just interesting to look at this huge span of Wright's life. So, um, Wright was born in 1867 in Richland Center, Wisconsin. And I just happened to find a picture part, postcard of it. Uh, and died in 1959, uh, just as he was finishing the Guggenheim Museum. When Wright was born, the life expectancy, and it's, it, it, it's, you know, he used to say life expectancy was 40. That's meaningless. The average life of the people who signed the Declaration of Independence was 80. Um, so the question is whether or not you count in their infant mortality. So half of all children died before six months old. So that'll screw up your average. So the thing is to say, what if you make it to 20? So when Wright was born, if he made it to 20, he didn't die of a childhood disease. You would live till 60. Uh, when Wright died, the life expectancy was 70. When Wright was born, the US population was 35 million. It's now about 10 times that. When Wright died, it was 180 million, about half of what it is today. When Wright was born, the population of Chicago was 220,000. When he died, it was 3,500,000. When Wright was born, half of all the labor force was farmers. When Wright died, it was 8%. Today, it's 2%. And that's due to mechanization. Instead of having 100 people out there with scythes cutting the wheat, you have one person in an air-conditioned combine doing a thousand acres um, with a machine. 
So that's like the span of Wright's life. Now, here's a fun slide. Here's the Winslow House, which we saw in 1900-1902. And here's the, a car in the driveway. Anybody know what kind of car that is? Mercedes? Correct. So it's a 1990s Mercedes. Um, pretty, looks like it fits there, right? This is what a car looked like when Wright built that house. <laughs> so look at how modern that house is by our taste compared to that car. So this is a car in 1900, and this is a car when Frank Lloyd Wright died. So, oh, anybody not sign in? Start over here. Um, I teach a course on impact of technology. I'm right now um, reading Max Tate Marks. Life 3.0, book on artificial intelligence. So, um, and I'm a big fan of Ray Kurzweil. I regularly attend conferences that he's at. He's a leading futurist. And his discussion of accelerating change, that the rate of change is accelerating. I made a diagram of that last week, taking off. And so, in the next six months, we will create more information than the entire human race created in its entire previous history. On the other hand, do I see as much change in my life as Frank Lloyd Wright saw in his? Uh, these are Civil War siege guns. These were the fiercest weapons when Wright was born. This is a hydrogen bomb. They were testing hydrogen bombs in the, before Wright died in the, in the 50s. Um, one hydrogen bomb can take out a, an entire continent. Uh, now Hiroshima is totally rebuilt, big deal. Less people died in Hiroshima than died in the fire bombing of Tokyo. Um, a hydrogen bomb can take out an entire continent. When Wright was born, they, uh, they had balloons for military surveillance during the Civil War. By the time Wright died, they had communication satellites. When Wright was born that year, they finished the Intercontinental Railroad. So here they are meeting, building from the east, building from the west. They meet in the middle. They drive a golden spike. I hope somebody took it home. Uh, and when Wright, by the time Wright died, he was traveling on 707s. We're still in the, seven, the 700s family of Boeing Airlines. What's the big difference of the 787? It's made out of plastic. <laughs> All that aluminum in there ain't aluminum, it's plastic. Um, just around the time Wright was born, they had the first successful transatlantic cable. When Wright died, they had communication satellites. When Wright was born, it was a telegraph. By the time he died, they had the Prince's Telephone. When Wright was born, they didn't even have the Victrola. You made your own music. Somebody in the family had to be able to play the piano. When Wright died, he was watching color TV. When Wright was born, they were just starting sophisticated mechanical calculators. By the time Wright died, we had the first generation IBM computers and the first transistors. So, um, 
we'll discuss this much more. What was the 20th century all about? What was Frank Lloyd Wright's role in the 20th century? And uh, what does that mean for us today? How, you know, Wright's architecture was part of and helped create his time. How is our architecture today part of and helped create our time?